Hi, I'm Melissa Smith, an AP U.S. History teacher from Cypress High School in Magna, Utah. In this video, I'm going to show you how to answer the DBQ. So let's get started. If you want to work through this DBQ with me, click on the link you see over the video now, and you can download the PDF of the DBQ you'll see in this session. So let's talk about how do you best approach the DBQ. There are probably lots of different ways to do this, but this is what I would recommend to my own students and to you. The first step is always to read the prompt and figure out what is this prompt asking me to do? What type of question is it? What is the time period it's asking me about? Secondly, then you need to read through the documents. There are seven documents. Read through all of them and take notes on each document. You don't want to read these documents over and over and over again. So take good notes and as you read through them. Third, after you've read through the documents, consider how do I want to organize my response? What kind of story are these documents telling me? And how, how do I want to answer this question? Next, take a couple of minutes and brainstorm. What kind of evidence do you know that you could use for contextualization? What sort of evidence do you know that you could also use in your essay um, for the evidence beyond the documents point? And then figure out what your thesis is going to be, because an essay with a really good thesis tends to be a better uh, essay. So make sure that you know what your thesis um, should say. Let's go through these a little bit more specifically. So let's start by reading the prompt and figuring out what the prompt is asking you to do. So in this case, the DBQ prompt is asking you to evaluate the extent of change in ideas about American independence from 1763 to 1783. Well, this is a question about change. So you want to consider what's changing about these ideas about American independence. Is there a lot of change? Is it mostly continuity? There's a little bit of a mix of both. And pay attention to the time period, 1763 to 1783. That's a pretty tight time period. 1763 would be when the French and Indian War ends. 1783 would be when the American Revolution ends. So you're only looking at a couple of decades. Next, you wanna read the documents and make sure that you are taking really good notes on the documents. There are a few things that I think you should look for when you read through the documents, okay? First, just figure out what's this document saying? What's the take home message? Can you summarize that to yourself? And just jot down some notes, a bullet point or two. Then consider how does this document help you to answer the prompt? How would that fit into your essay? And then can you explain the document's point of view, purpose, historical situation, and our audience? This is that sourcing point. You don't have to do this for all seven of the documents, but try to take notes on as many of the documents as you can, because if you have three or four really solid examples of this, that's what you want to include in your essay. So we're going to look closely at just a couple of documents and practice doing these three steps. So the first document that we're going to look at is document three in this set. This comes from Samuel Adams, and it's called The Rights of the Colonists, and it was published in 1772. So let's figure out what this document is saying. Well, he's saying that all men have a right to remain in a state of nature as long as they please. He says, but in a case of intolerable um, oppression, they have a right to leave the society that they belong to and enter into another. And then at the end, he has this kind of cute sort of 18th century hippie idea that, you know, if men uh, really only need to follow the law of nature. So then ask yourself, how does this document relate to the prompt and how would this help you to answer the prompt? Well, I would say that Adams is demonstrating a change in ideas about American independence. He's saying that the laws of nature are more important than man-made laws. He's definitely promoting independence, and it's showing a change of ideas uh, amongst the colonists. Now, is there something that you could add to this document that helps to explain the document's point of view, its purpose, the historical situation, and our audience? Here you want to say something about the document that's maybe not explicitly stated in the document that helps to explain why this document is important and why this might be relevant to your argument. In this case, I would say that Adams is definitely using ideas from the Enlightenment. 
Um, and he's using those ideas in order to support growing calls for independence. In this case, I would call that his purpose. Um, his purpose is to use Enlightenment ideas in order to strengthen this idea of independence from Great Britain. Let's practice this one more time. Now we'll look at document five. This source comes from Janet Shaw. This is a journal of a lady of quality. It was published in June of 1775. And the source line helpfully tells us that Shaw was a Scot who was visiting her brother, who was the merchant in Wilmington, North Carolina. So what's this document saying? Well, she's talking about how the patriots would come around and sort of shake people down and say, hey, agree to join us and your persons and properties are safe. If you refuse, well, basically burn your house down. And then she goes on to say to not agree with the patriots takes a lot of courage. And she basically says that these patriots are of the lower sorts. Mm -hmm. So how does this document relate to the prompt? Well, Shaw is claiming that the patriots are villains and are bullying landowners into supporting their cause. So I think this suggests that not everyone was changing their ideas about independence, that some people really wanted to remain loyal to Great Britain. Now, what could I say about this document's point of view, purpose, historical situation, and our audience? Before I've read this document, I had never heard of Janet Shaw before. You probably haven't either. I mean, maybe you have, but I don't know who she is. But I can tell from this document that she's clearly an upper-class woman who really is very critical of how loyalists are being treated by the patriots. And she's also showing that she thinks that the patriots are, as she said, the lower sorts, which really helps to demonstrate a class division between loyalists and patriots. Well, that might help me in my essay when I'm talking about changing ideas about American independence. Now, this is just an example of how I would approach two of these documents. You would just do the same thing for all seven of the documents. After you've read through all seven of the documents, our next step is start to figure out how do you want to organize your response? What sort of information are we getting out of the documents that could help you. Now, there's no rule about how long your essay needs to be at all. It needs to be as long as it needs to be. I am giving you a very rough outline here of about five paragraphs, but take that with a grain of salt. You need to make this as long as you need to make it, okay? So in your opening paragraph, Contextualization doesn't have to go in your opening paragraph. It can go anywhere in your essay. And if you're doing a good job, you'll get your point. I generally think the opening paragraph is usually a pretty good place to put that. Your thesis, however, does need to be either in your opening paragraph or in your concluding paragraph. And I would recommend putting it in both. Start with your thesis in your opening statement, in your opening paragraph restate your thesis and your conclusion just to make sure that you're getting that point. Now, my next paragraph or so, I'm going to talk about how colonists' ideas are changing to maybe just wanting a say in new taxes and in laws. They're maybe not talking about independence, but they're talking about how they want to have more of a say in the laws that govern them. In my next paragraph or so, I'm going to talk about how colonists' ideas changed even more to want freedom from Great Britain. And then in my next paragraph, fourth paragraph or so, I'm going to make a counter argument. I'm going to say that some colonists' ideas didn't really change that much, and they remained loyal to Great Britain, and that ideas really weren't changing for everybody. And then in my concluding paragraph, I want to summarize my big ideas, and I definitely want to restate my thesis. Okay, next, we need to consider what sort of evidence do we know that could help us to get this contextualization point or the evidence beyond the documents point. In this case, on this slide, let's talk about contextualization. Remember that for contextualization, you wanna describe a broader historical context that's relevant to the prompt. This information could come before the time period, it could be information during the time period, or maybe something that continues slightly after the time period. Contextualization doesn't have to go in your opening paragraph, especially if you're using information that goes slightly beyond the time period, it might work really well in your concluding paragraph. Some ideas that you could use for contextualization are things like ideas from the Enlightenment, maybe something specific about the French and Indian War, maybe you want to talk about mercantilism. 
I'm saying also maybe the legacy of the English Civil War, which happened a bit before this, but there was definitely this statement about the rights of English people, which colonists might have been very concerned about, or revolutionary ideas that were adapted um, and used in the U.S. Constitution after the American Revolution. In my specific example here, I'm going to say that before the French and Indian War, the colonists experienced salutary neglect from Britain. Policies like the Navigation Acts were never really enforced, and colonial legislatures experienced relative freedom in creating their own laws and taxes. So in this case, I'm going to talk about salutary neglect as something very specific, and it's helping to provide a broader historical context that would be relevant to the prompt. Now, we're going to keep brainstorming. And we're going to talk about what sort of evidence could we use beyond the documents. Now, this shouldn't be that difficult for you. This is the fun stuff that was leading up to the American Revolution. So all that you learned in your class about the Boston Massacre, the Boston Tea Party, maybe the Sons or Daughters of Liberty, your favorite American revolutionary figure, like maybe Alexander Hamilton, George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, all of those people could work really well, um, as long as you are kind of describing how that would help you to um, make an argument that's relevant to the prompt. Here I have a, an example that just says, when parliament passed laws like the Townsend Act or the Tea Act, many colonists became angry that they had to experience taxation without representation. These colonists proposed ways to be better represented by parliament or to be subject only to taxes passed by colonial legislatures. So something like the Townsend Acts um, would be evidence beyond the documents. Document one kind of references the Tea Act, so that alone probably wouldn't be that helpful, but definitely bringing up taxation without representation is going to get you the point here. Okay, what is next on our list of things to do? We've figured out what these documents are saying. We've figured out how we kind of roughly want to organize our essay then write a thesis that will reflect that and will be a good argument. We need a state of claim as a clear line of reasoning. So here I'm going to say that ideas about American independence changed dramatically between 1763 and 1783. In the beginning, colonists wanted representation and a say in the creation of new laws, but that Americans eventually then wanted complete freedom from British rule. However, many colonists remained loyal to British rule throughout this time period. So I'm basically stating what my line of reasoning is. I'm saying that Americans wanted a lot of change. They wanted representation and a say in the laws. They have then changed more to wanting complete freedom. But then I'm gonna qualify my argument and I'm gonna say, however, some of them weren't changing very much and we see a lot of continuity and that some of them remain loyal to British rule. Okay. Once you have gone through all of these steps, you should now be set up for success. You have an outline for your essay. You have a clear thesis. Just make sure that you're following through on that thesis and using that document information in order to support your claim, to support your thesis. So I'd like to thank you for joining me, and I want to wish you all of the best on exam day.